win the Krypton Factor tonight. Men Webster, aged 36, is a law student from Leeds. His interests are squash, chess and crosswords. Bill Bigley is 27. He's an electronics engineer from McGull Merseyside. He enjoys current affairs, reading and DIY. Phil Haberman is 26 years of age, a chartered accountant living in Ilford, Essex, whose interests are cinema, sport and bridge. And Terry O'Neill, aged 40, is an architect in Coventry who enjoys theatre, music and cycling. And here is your host, Gordon Burns. Good evening and welcome to the penultimate heat in our bid to find the 1982 United Kingdom superperson. And in the last few weeks, it's suddenly all gone right for the ladies, with Helen McLeod and Angie Sales winning their way through to the semi-finals. But that cannot continue tonight, simply because it's an all-male lineup. So at this point, let me simply say, may the best man win and go straight into round one mental agility. And tonight it's something of a knotty problem, though the explanation is perfectly straightforward. The contestants are about to see nine separate pictures each one showing an entangled piece of rope. The contestants have to decide if, on pulling the two ends, the rope would immediately unravel or tie into a knot. Now, on four occasions, a knot would actually be formed and the contestants must pick out those four. So with that, contestants, would you please now turn and face your screens. Coming up is the usual example, followed by your nine knotty problems. For example, when tightened, this makes a knot. And that is correct. When the ends are pulled, the rope ties into a knot. All right, contestants, please watch your screens carefully. Here come your nine tests. Which four pieces of rope, when pulled tightly, would form a knot? Test number one. Test number two. Test number three. Test number four. Test number five. Test number six. Test number seven. Test number eight. And test number nine. That's it. Turn to the front, please, contestants. All your selections, I see, have been made. Before we give you the points, let us first see the correct solution. Test number one was correct. When pulled tight, this rope knots. Test number three was also correct. This makes a knot. Test number six was correct. The rope knots. And finally, test number seven was correct. This rope will also make a knot. So, one, three, six, seven, the sequence that we're looking for. Let's go down the line. Len Webster has gone for one, two, three, six, so he's got three of them right, and six points for him. Bill Bigley, one, two, three, six, and that's also three right, and again, six points. Phil Haberman, two, three, four, five, which is just one right, and two points. And Terry O'Neill, one, two, three, seven, which is three right, and six points. So let us now enter all those points into the Masters scoreboard. And with one round gone, we have three contestants sharing the lead with a Krypton factor of six. From Leeds, Len Webster. From Merseyside, Bill Bigley. And from Coventry, Terry O'Neill. So a fairly even start as we move now to the challenge of the assault course and test the physical ability of the contestants. And with it being an all-male lineup, only the age handicap is operated in this race. And with two of the contestants being in their mid to late 30s and two in their 20s, there'll be a 13 seconds difference between the first to start and the last. So let's join all four now with the Army's Major Terry Holmes on the starting line. Yeah, it's frightening when you stand at one end. I used to do the hurdles at school, and when you get down to your marks and you look underneath the hurdles, it's like a tunnel, and it's all regular. The one thing that does frighten me is that the, the obstacle course is anything but regular. I must admit, I, I do find it quite frightening. But I, hopefully, in a race situation, you get fairly determined about it. And 
you push through. I hope. Take your marks. Terry O'Neill underway first, just a couple of seconds ahead of Len Webster, who will be in red and in the lane nearest to us, and in fact is underway. Terry O'Neill is a self-employed architect and is in fact studying for an open university degree at the moment. He comes from Coventry. And it's Terry O'Neill and Len Webster neck and neck. But watch Bill Bigley in light blue at the back there coming through very fast indeed. And in practice he looked most impressive and a man to keep an eye on. This is the race leader at the moment, Len Webster. He's done a 14 foot drop off the high balance. And Bill Bigley coming through now and jumps into second place. Slight stumble there from Len Webster. <laughs> and a marvellous recovery really there from Bill Bigley who almost went flat but in fact grabbed the rope in time to swing through into first place. He's a terrific competitor, Bill Bigley. Keen on football too, he plays centre forward for Crosby Football Club on Merseyside and is a strong supporter of Everton. So it's Bill Bigley in first place, then Len Webster, Terry O'Neill third, and the back marker at the moment is Phil Haberman, there he is, from Ilford. Now as Bill Bigley goes over the top of the scramble net, it's important for Len Webster to stay as close as possible because if a contestant is not fully fit, then from here on in it will show. He will start to tire and fade, and if it happens to Bill Bigley, then Len Webster will want to be close enough to take advantage. Keep going, that's it! Although having said that, Bill Bigley does look very strong as he goes to the last obstacle. This is the battle for third place, Terry O'Neill, and right behind him now, Phil Haberman. Quite a stiff wind blowing. You'll see that in fact from those flags in the background and it's not easy to go across that rope bridge as it sways around in the wind. But it hasn't hampered Bill Bigley too much and he starts his descent on the aerial slide. An electronics engineer with British Aerospace. He's judged the race well. He's left enough for a good finish. He puns up that hill. And Bill Bigley from Magull is the worthy winner of the race. Now it's Len Webster. An interesting man, Len. He, in his early 30s, gave up business and suddenly decided to study law, which he now does at Huddersfield Polytechnic. And he drags those weary limbs out of the mud to pound on through as Terry O'Neill comes down the aerial slide. But Len Webster from Leeds takes second place and Terry O'Neill wins his battle with Phil Haberman, who now completes the aerial slide. And Terry comes through to take third place. Well, a clear-cut victory there for Bill Bigley, and he gets the ten points. Len in second place gets six, Terry gets four, and Phil, who finished the course, gets two points. So we now enter those points into the scoreboard to join the points in the first round. And we now have a clear leader with a Krypton factor of 16, the electronics engineer from McGull, Merseyside, Bill Bigley. <laughs> We move into round three now, the intelligence test, and it's all fairly nicely balanced at the moment. And I have to say that balance plays a central part in this next test. The contestants have in front of them the Krypton K in a horizontal position. Cut into that K, you'll notice seven squares. On their benches, the contestants have been given seven different weights. Their task is to insert those weights into the squares in such a way that the K will swing from its horizontal position to a vertical one. There is only one solution, and contestants, are you ready to find it? The test starts now. The best strategy for the contestants here is to feel all the weights and work them out from heaviest to lightest. Then the heavier ones should fit into the backbone of the K they should then place all the others in and see what happens to the K, how it swings, and then begin to swap over until they've got the correct solution. Now those weights are made up of the colours of the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo and violet, and if you're watching in colour, that's the secret. Those colours should read from left to right. So red is the extreme left one, as Terry O'Neill has there. 
And that is the correct solution. Red, orange, green, yellow, blue, indigo, violet is right. But Phil Haberman is changing it over. The audience believed he was right. He decides he's not. I can tell you that he was right. And as Len Webster struggles with the wrong solution, he's quite a long way out there. Phil Haberman, in fact, decides to put them back the other way round, and he has found the solution and finishes first, and it would have been a lot quicker had he kept it the first time. This is Bill Bigley, just behind him in second place with the correct solution. And I can see Terry O'Neill about to finish. In goes the last piece, and he gets third. Well, I'm sure it's a weight off their minds to be finished with that test, but the fastest to finish was Phil Haberman, and he gets the ten points. Then Bill gets six points, Terry four, and Len failed to finish, but he gets two points, and we enter all those now into the scoreboard. And two rounds to go, and look at that, three contestants now share second place with a Krypton factor of 14, but still out in front, now with a Krypton factor of 22, from Miguel Merseyside, Bill Bigley. Well, a good position to be in as we now go to the observation round, and tonight's film clip features the first ever winners of the World Cup. Not Uruguay, as the record books would have it, but West Auckland Football Club, who won the Sir Thomas Lipton Trophy in Italy way back in 1910. The fairy tale story was recently told in television film starring Dennis Waterman. Right, contestants, please turn now to your screens. First the clip, then the questions. Sixty-one adults at a penny halfpenny, seven shillings and seven halfpenny. Twelve juniors at a halfpenny, six pence. Total seven shillings and seven halfpenny. Deduct. Five leaving at half time. Throttens three farthings. Payment to Stockton Football Club. <coughs> two shillings and fivepence farthing. Grand total four shillings and ten pence halfpenny. Your uh, new ball collection raised four and three farthings. Well, gentlemen. Yes, Wetnam. Well, not bad, Mr. Barrett. Well, considering the way our performance has been fallen off, it's surprising we've been able to hang on to our support as well as we have. Indeed, as of this day, the 9th of March, 1910, our balance at the bank stands at 15 pounds, 19 shillings, and 10 pounds, three farthings. At the Diamond Jubilee of our late Queen, God rest her, I organized together with Princess Alexandra, now our beloved Queen, the Poor Folk's Royal Dinner. 400,000 of the poorest people in the kingdom had a square meal that day. I gave 25,000 pounds. Well, it appealed to my sense of democracy. Well, it's very good of you, I'm sure, sir, but... I'm not finished yet, John. Many civic dignitaries, the Lord Mayor of London even, sent me congratulations on my fine gesture, but of them all, that little lad's letter touched my heart. Right, John, West Auckland, football pitch. As a football team, I've inquired. Find that lad, John. He'll be a man now. Find him and tell him that his team will represent England in the Lipton World Trophy. West Auckland, sir. <laughs> David Rees Thomas. Th thank you, sir. No, young man. I thank you. I should have done it years ago. You brought us all together. Good luck. Thank you, sir. And, uh, Sidney Barron, top secretary. Pleased to meet you, sir. And that was it. We'd done it. The Sir Thomas Lipton Trophy. The World Cup. Turn to the front, please, contestants. Two questions for each of you coming up now. They're worth two points each, and we start with you, Len. When the club's secretary, Sidney Barron, read the statement of account at the beginning of that clip, how much did he say the new ball collection raised? Sixpence three farthings. No, you're tuppence hard. Fourpence three farthings, sorry. In the West Auckland dressing room, what were hanging on the wall apart from the pictures? Um, 
It was a shield. That's right, football shield, so two points there. On now to you, Bill. During the reading of the accounts, right at the start, how many people were said to have left at half-time? 40,000. Uh, only five, I'm sorry, afraid. Sorry. Uh, but you don't score. Uh, when Sir Thomas Lipton was introduced to the West Auckland players just before the cup final started, there was a man in the background at the end of the line. What was he doing? Taking photographs. Correct, and two points for you. On now to Phil. How much money did Sir Thomas Lipton say he gave towards the charity dinner? £25,000. Correct, two points. Now, immediately before the Italian general shook hands with the first West Auckland player during the presentation of teams, what did he do? Just before he shook hands. Must have an answer. Any idea? He introduced himself by name. No, he saluted. You stay on two as well, Phil. Everybody's got two. On now to Terry. When the club secretary, Sidney Barron, finished reading the accounts, he dated them. What month was it in 1910? March. Correct. Two points. On the mantelpiece behind Sir Thomas Lipton was a large clock. Immediately to the right of it, as we looked at it, were two what? And I must hurry you for an answer. Um, vases. No, there were two ship's bells. So you two finish in two. Everybody finishes in two as we move now into the open section where this is on the buzzer. First person to buzz answers. But if you get it wrong, contestants, it's immediately open for anyone else to try. Are you ready? There were several paintings on the walls of Sir Thomas's drawing room of what? <coughs> Bill. Ships. Correct. One point. Sir Thomas was talking to his private secretary. What was the secretary's Christian name? Terry. John. Correct. You saw a close-up of the young boy's letter to Sir Thomas. What were the last two words, Terry? Uh, yours sincerely, David Rhys Davis. No. The last two words. Anybody else? It was in... F Bill? Yours truly. No, it was County Durham. And the last question. How many poor folk were said to have been given a... S Len? 400,000. Is correct, and one point to you. And that, in fact, concludes the first part of this two-part round. And now to the identity parade. And the person we want the contestants to pick out of the lineup, they in fact just saw in a lineup. He was the young West Auckland player, David Rhys Thomas, the last player, in fact, to be introduced to Sir Thomas Lipton in the presentation of the teams at the start. And he was thanked for bringing the teams together. Well, David Rhys Thomas is in our lineup of nine footballers for two more points. Which one is he? Right, contestants, will you make your selections, please, now? And looking down the line, this is amazing, they have all gone for number eight. So, can I now ask number eight in the lineup to step forward, please? And there he is, the choice of all four contestants. So, they're either all right or they're all wrong. Let's find out now as I ask David Rees Thomas from the football West Auckland team. To make himself known to us now, please. It is indeed <laughs> number eight in our lineup in real life actor Di Bradley. <laughs> well, they all got him. First time it's happened in this series, and they all get the extra two points. But let's feed all the points won in the two sections of that round into the scoreboard. One round to go, don't forget, and it's still all very close, but out in front still with a Krypton factor now of 27 is Merseyside's Bill Bigley. <laughs> on into the fifth and final round general knowledge in the happy state that any one of the contestants could still win and get that semi-final place. This, of course, is in two sections. We start with the individual questions and your set of three, Len. The Greeks believed that the world was supported on the shoulders of a giant titan. Who was that? Atlas. Correct. Two points. Which major British city stands at the mouth of the River Lagan? Must have an answer. Edinburgh. No, across in Northern Ireland, Belfast. Which instrument of the orchestra has a name meaning literally pleasant sound in Greek? 
Oboe? No, the euphonium. So you finish there on two, and on now to you, Bill. Who was the Roman god of wine and fertility? Bacchus. Correct, two points. Which country's capital is Santiago? Chile. Correct, another two points. On which play by Shakespeare was the musical West Side Story based? It was... Troilus and Cressida. No, Romeo and Juliet. But you finish on four, Bill, and on to Phil. Which son of Aphrodite was the Greek god of love and had a magical bow? Apollo. No, I'd have taken Cupid or I'd have taken Eros, the same. Into which sea does the Volga River flow? Which sea? The Black Sea. No, the Caspian Sea. In which city is the La Scala Opera House? Milan. Correct, and two points. Now to Terry. What was the name of the winged horse of Bellerophon, which became the badge of British airborne troops? Pegasus. Correct, two points. Name one of the three American states that borders the state of California. New Mexico. No, you could have said either Nevada, Oregon, or Arizona. What is meant by the musical term diminuendo? Um, reduced sound. Correct, two points, and you finish on four. And we now move into the second phase of this round. 90 seconds of questions on the buzzer with a point deducted for a wrong answer. So you ready, contestants? The clock starts now. What was the nickname of the Scottish Highland clan chief, Robert McGregor? Terry. Rob Roy. Correct, one point. Rob Roy, Grandpa Dixon and Ina Harkness are varieties of which flower? The answer is rose. With which game do you associate the names of Pete Rose, Ty Cobb and Babe Ruth? Len. Baseball. Correct. The baseball ground is the home stadium of which bill? Derby County. Correct. The county previously called Monmouthshire is now called what? Gwent is the answer. For what purpose do people collect guano from South American sea coasts? Terry. Fertiliser. Correct. Which former film actress was the mother of Lorna Luft and Lisa Minnelli? Bill. Judy Garland. Correct. Who wrote the novels Jude the Obscure, The Woodlanders? Phil. Thomas Hardy. Correct. Who preceded George Thomas as Speaker of the House of Commons? The answer, Selwyn Lloyd. The last British woman athlete to win an Olympic gold medal was in the pentathlon in 19... Interrupted by Terry. Mary Peters. Correct. Petrology is the study of the origin... Bill. Of rocks. Correct. What comes in species called rock hoppers, kings and... Penguins. Len. Len? Penguins. Correct. Which British composer wrote the Sinfonia Antarctica in 1953? Phil. Vaughan Williams. Correct. And that means it's the end of the round and the contest, and the winner tonight with a Krypton factor of 34 is the electronics engineer from Magal Merseyside, Bill Bigley. Well, our warmest congratulations to Bill Bigley, a worthy winner, and we look forward to seeing him again in our semi-finals. We shall be back at the same time next week with the last of our 12 heats. Do hope you can join us for that. In the meantime, from all the contestants and from myself, good night.